Hi guys, how's it going? Good. All right. So we're going to be talking to you guys about plastic pollution. So how many of you guys have seen plastic wash up on the beaches here in Key Biscayne? Almost everyone, right? Um, so plastic is a huge issue because it's used very uh, quickly and it's thrown away almost every single time. Um, so this presentation is pretty much just to show you guys in-depth information about plastic and different sources of it. Um, and kind of the history about plastic pollution. Plastic was created in the 1950s. Um, it was actually created to, believe it or not, solve uh, the cutting down of trees. So basically, by creating plastic, people weren't using as much paper, and they thought it was better for the environment. Um, very quickly, though, plastic started being thrown everywhere in the streets, and it was just being put everywhere into the environment. Here are some things that are made out of plastic. So you got anything from bottle caps to cigarette butts, Starbucks cups, phone cameras, toothbrushes, um, food containers, utensils, pill bottles, plastic wrapping, straws, bags, candy wrappers, clothing, um, fishing line, even stuffed animals are made out of plastic. So this is basically a graph showing plastic production over time. Um, so starting in the 1950s, you know, very little plastic was being created, um, but shortly after, it just started accelerating um, and only 9% of all this entire plastic has been recycled so very 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 little amount but where is a way so you throw away something in the trash um, or in the recycling bin but where does it go after that so there are over 2,000 active landfills in the United States alone and more than 30,000 of them are already sealed up so what does that mean well the landfills that you see like this where they're actively putting trash into it um, there's 2,000 of those right but when you look at the size of a landfill when you drive, how many of you guys have seen landfills driving in the highway? They're huge, right? They look like cities almost. Um, so there's more than 30,000 of those landfills that are already closed up and that aren't being used anymore. This is another place where trash goes. Um, can anyone tell me what this is? Have you guys ever seen one of these? No? Okay, so this is an incinerator. Um, an incinerator is basically a plant where they take trash and they burn it in an enclosed environment and they create electricity from it, right? Um, so we were actually grateful enough to get a tour out of one of these facilities with a zero waste culture and we were able to see kind of what goes behind into burning all the trash, making energy out of it and the sheer magnitude of trash that actually passes through these facilities every single year. So in the US alone there are 80 commercial incinerator plants and these 80 plants process 70 billion pounds of trash every single year. So 70 billion pounds of trash is a lot of trash. Um, and that's all being burnt, right? 41% of all worldwide trash is burnt openly on the side of the roads like this. Um, here in the United States, we're a developed country. We have infrastructure, we have funds, and we have the government to kind of coordinate where trash goes. Um, every week, you guys have your trash picked up by the garbage men, right? In other countries, they don't have that. So where do they have to put their trash? Well, they have to burn it. Um, and burning trash is very bad because it, it, it degrades air quality um, and it really releases harmful chemicals into the air. So children that are growing up in Ethiopia, for example, are six times more likely to develop respiratory infections compared to children here in the United States like you guys. So just think about it and really be grateful for the air quality we have here because in almost 70% of the world, they're breathing in oxygen that's like this. You know, it's, it's, it's polluted and it's very harmful for them. The chemicals that are released from plastic can, cause har uh, can disrupt hormones and cause cancer. Um, so you guys got to really look at it and, and think about how lucky you are because these children are growing up with the chances of developing cancer much more frequently than you guys are. So this is an example of burnt trash. Um, so after trash is burnt, after plastic is burnt, basically it melts down into a hard packed disc. Um, so these are pictures from Nicaragua, which is also a developing country. And over there, 
we saw all this trash on the beach and they actually burn it all and it ends up looking like this. So you can actually see individual little straws there. You can see you know, candy wrappers. Um, and you know, this is just an example showing you what, what it looks like after it's burnt and all the chemicals are released into the air. And believe it or not, this is here in Miami. So this was a landfill that caught on fire about three weeks ago. Um, the fire was started randomly. They still haven't figured out the cause of the fire, but it could have been a battery acid. Uh, it could have been a cigarette butt that was still lit after someone threw it. Um, but it was burning for 36 hours straight. So all this plastic was being burnt. Um, and this landfill specifically was in Homestead. So it was a little bit south of here. And all the people that lived in Homestead for 36 hours were being bombarded with plastic smoke. And uh, believe it or not, the firefighters and the fire rescue of the area released a statement saying that if you had any respiratory illnesses or had trouble breathing, that you should lock your doors, seal your windows, and not try and breathe any of the smoke in. Um, so my friend Stephen and I, Stephen's not here right now, um, but we went to this landfill to go document it so that people could actually see what was going on because the news were covering it, but they didn't explain how bad the plastic was for people to breathe. Um, so this is just an example of accidents that happen. And you know, this is like a very small dent in the surface when it comes to plastic being burned, but it does happen here as well. And then this is a video kind of explaining uh, land-based trash, right? So you see all the trash that ends up on the beaches. It has to come from somewhere. And somewhere is land. Almost 80% of all marine trash is land-based. So this is a video kind of explaining different ways that trash can enter our oceans. So you guys saw the pictures of all the trash in the water, right? All that comes from storm drains. Every time it rains, the water goes down storm drains, right? And in different parts of Miami, there's outfall systems, right? So these pipes drain all the water from the streets and dump it directly into the bay. So when you saw the plastic bag full of litter being dumped into the ocean, that was actually in Coconut Grove. Um, on 27th Avenue here in Miami, there's a major outfall system, right? So that collects all the water from 8th Street, uh, 27th Avenue, and all the streets that layer up that way. And that's a major outfall point. So every time it rains, especially in the summertime when it rains almost every single day, uh, this pipe is just constantly releasing plastics and styrofoam and microplastics and oil directly into the bay itself. Um, and why does this harm the marine life? Because these, these manatees, these sea turtles, dolphins, crocodiles that live in our bay here in Miami are directly affected by all this pollution that's coming out of these outfall pipes. The most famous statistic, um, if you guys may have heard of it, it's that by 2050, there's gonna be more plastic in the oceans than fish. So just imagine if you were a fish and there's more plastic in the ocean than food. That's like, if you were a human, there's more plastic in your life available than there is food. Um, if you are a fish, like, uh, like what happens in the oceans, you would probably end up eating the plastic. And that's what ends up happening a lot of times and it severely affects marine life. So with all this plastic entering the water, um, it ends up forming like a film on top and uh, it looks like this. And when the plastic stays there in the middle of the ocean, just floating around, collecting a bunch of sun, it photodegrades and turns into smaller and smaller pieces, like you can see there. You can't really see like a full water bottle or a full container. It's all small, broken up pieces that, and that's because it's been sitting there for years, um, just photodegrading. So has anyone ever heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Yeah. So what do you guys think it is? Or what do you know about it? Just a lot of plastic floating in the ocean? I guess the state of Connecticut. Yeah, like the state of Connecticut, okay. Yeah, so what if I told you there's actually five of them in every ocean gyre that exists? So the biggest one is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and that's probably why you guys have heard of it. Um, but there are more. So 
gyres are essentially where there's a dead zone of wind in the ocean, which makes it perfect for all this plastic to just get caught there and float around and photodegrade because there's not a lot of wind, so it just all accumulates there. The size of the Great Pacific gar Garbage Patch is actually twice the size of Texas. Um, and it's not like an island, per se, that you could stand on. Um, in its most concentrated parts, which are these blue areas here, it's very dense, like that photo there. But in the other parts, it's just like a soup of plastic just floating around. And you could find all sorts of plastic in there, like that huge barrel of garbage and a whole lot of uh, fishing nets that are used. And those pieces of plastic are very bad for the environment. As you can see, there was a sea turtle uh, caught in that plastic there. Uh, so ghost fishing. Ghost fishing is when fishermen use um, these nets and things to catch uh, what they sell. And whenever something happens and they have to ditch those nets, they just leave them there in the ocean floating around. And those nets, like all other plastics, end up floating around and photodegrading and turning into a bunch of tiny little pieces. But before all that happens, um, it's very easy for, angle, for animals to get entangled in these uh, nets. And for example, sharks, uh, sharks need to be swimming to breathe because they use ram ventilation. So if a shark were to get caught in this net, it, it wouldn't be able to swim, therefore it wouldn't be able to breathe, and then that's how they suffocate and die. Um, and same thing for other animals. It, it just makes it very hard for them to get to the surface to breathe air. It's very easy for animals to, mis to mistake plastic items in the ocean for their food. For example, the photo on the right here is a, well, your left is a plastic bag, and the photo on the right is a jellyfish. But imagine if you were a turtle, and you were very hungry, and you were just swimming through the ocean, and you came across the plastic bag. You would think that it looks a lot like the jellyfish, so you'd go ahead and take a bite out of it. And that's what happens a lot of times to the sea turtles, and that's why their populations have suffered. Microplastics are essentially what happens when plastics sit in the sun for a very long time photodegrading. Um, they just break up into smaller and smaller pieces, and these are really bad because when they do break up into smaller pieces, their surface area actually increases and allows them to absorb um, more toxins in the water, like um, that runoff of land and things like that. So because they absorb it, then they concentrate it. And uh, that's just really bad. That way, if an animal eats it, they're not only eating the plastic, which is very harmful to them, but also the chemicals that they've absorbed in the water. So microplastics are any plastic that are less than two millimeters in size. And it's just very easy for animals to ingest them because they're so small. Plastic never goes anywhere. It just keeps going, breaking up in smaller and smaller pieces. And uh, eventually, well, they're already finding, there's a lot of studies that shows that there's actually plastics in the air we breathe and, and things like that. They're finding plastic in, in the, the French Alps. Um, and there's also a new study that came out that said that the average American consumes about a credit card's worth of plastic every day. Uh, sorry, each week, just in their day-to-day -day life. Whether that be drinking bottled water, because that has microplastics in it as well, but we'll get to that. Or just in the food you eat, if you eat a lot of fish, uh, fish are ingesting this plastic in the ocean, and then the plastic in, their, in the fish is so small that it's actually in their bloodstream. So if you eat the fish, you can actually be ingesting those microplastics as well. So this is photodegradation, right? So Kobe mentioned photodegradation a couple times uh, throughout the PowerPoint. But what is photodegradation, right? So when you guys get sunburnt at the beach sometimes, right? The next couple days, you guys are peeling a little bit. The skin's coming off in various tiny, tiny pieces. Well, plastic does the same thing. Um, once it sits in the sun for a good amount of time, the UV rays actually break apart the chemical compounds within plastic and it starts rubbing off into tiny little pieces like your skin does when you're sunburned. Um, so basically, after a couple months, plastic can start to photodegrade and start to release these microplastics into the ocean. Um, again, allowing animals to ingest it without them knowing it, uh, allowing us to breathe in these microplastics without actually knowing it. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's very bad. Um, so when you find a piece of photodegraded plastic, what would it feel like? Well. Essentially, if you're walking on the beach and you find one of these pieces of plastic, you'll be able to break it apart very easily. Um, it's almost like if you were to drop a glass plate from here onto the floor and it shattered into pieces, that's how easily microplastics are created. Um, so the plastics break apart that quickly.
Next. Synthetic fiber pollution. How many of you guys have clothing in your closets made out of polyester or nylon? Almost all of us, right? I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. Um, so actually, synthetic fibers, when you wash them in your uh, washing machine, they release tiny little microfibers into the water stream of your cycle, and that water ends up going somewhere, right? So that's all being released into the water stream. So when you wash your clothing, uh, just make sure that, you know, they, they sell these nets now that can actually catch the microplastics. Um, or you can just buy clothing that's not made out of plastic. Uh, bamboo, hemp, organic cotton, um, silk are all options that are eco-friendly. Um, and one person cre can create up to 793 pounds of microfiber waste each single year. I think I read a study that said that the average American purchase, purchases 63 new articles of clothing each year. So we're buying way too much clothing and we're throwing them away a lot of the time. Um, so if you guys can go buy used clothing at Goodwill or you can go thrift shopping, um, that's, those are some ways to eliminate the usage of or the creation of microplastics from clothing itself. Um, and up to 1,900 plastic particles can be released when washing one single synthetic garment. Um, so that's a lot of little tiny pieces that you guys aren't taking into mind um, when you're washing your clothing. You know, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. So worldwide, 100,000 marine animals are killed each year because of plastic <coughs> litter, right? So that's because they're ingesting it, they're being entangled within it, um, you know, and it's blocking their digestive system. So they actually can't process any more food after they eat all this plastic. Um, and 267 species have been found in, entangled by marine litter and with plastic inside of their stomachs. Um, I think it's three out of five sea turtles have ingested plastic already. So if you think of all the turtles collectively around the world, um, almost 80% of them have ingested plastic already, or 60%, sorry. So this is a picture of a bird. This is a seabird, right? Can anyone tell me where this bird comes from? Take a guess, what, like some of the slides we went over previously. Where could this bird be flying over quite often? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. <laughs> Close, close. Um, so basically, this bird is from the Midway Islands. This island is actually located in the heart of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And these birds inhabit this island, right? And you guys saw the study that said by 2050, there'll be more plastic than fish within the oceans, right? These seabirds consume fish. So if there's more plastic than fish in their area, they're going to be consuming all the plastic instead because they're at the point where they're starving. Right? So when they mistake these pieces of plastic for food or a shrimp or something else that they consume on a regular basis, um, it's actually going to block their digestive system and they won't be able to process any more food and they'll actually starve to death. Um, so this is one bird out of all seabirds. Um, if you guys have ever been to Crandon, right, there's a bunch of ibises that walk around by the zoo. Those ibises love picking through the sand and looking for food crumbs, right? Um, a lot of the times these microplastics look exactly like Doritos crumbs or look like a piece of bread and they'll easily like mistake it for food because they don't have hands, they don't have the judgment that we have to say, oh, that's plastic, that's not food. Um, so all these animals are actually ingesting plastic without knowing it. One million seabirds die each and every year from plastic pollution. Um, by 2050, 99% of seabirds will have ingested plastic. So that's in correlation to, you have a question? Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. And I think it's important to note that a lot of the adult seabirds go out and collect True. food to feed to their babies and mm -hmm. they're just eating their babies' plastic and so they end up dying before they ever reach adulthood. Yep. And that's that's very true as well. You know, you see like the videos of the penguins feeding their baby penguins, how they kind of just throw up into their baby penguins' mouths. That's exactly what these birds do as well. Also, if you guys have any questions throughout the PowerPoint, just raise your hand and we'll uh, get it settled with. Any questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the water from Miami and the heavy rains mm -hmm. flows into the river. Yes. Bay, yep. Whatever. Why can't they put strainers on the outlet so that they can catch the water? So that's something that we've brought up to the city of Miami a couple times. Um, they've 
not been reluctant on it. They just haven't acted very quickly on it. I think it's been about two years now since we've actually confronted them about possibly putting in these nets on the ends of the storm drains. Um, you know, and it's a large city. I guess they have a lot more stuff to handle. But this is an, an important topic because it's, it's killing the ecotourism within South Florida itself. Um, so, you know, if all this plastic's entering the oceans and these smaller fish are eating it, you know, these larger fish that people come to fly in from all over the world to fish are going to be ingesting plastic in the end. So these people that pay thousands of dollars to come catch a marlin to eat it for dinner one night, they're going to be eating a marlin that's full of plastic in the end. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, like, hard topic when it comes to, you know, dealing with the local government and stuff like that. Um, and it all comes down to showing support, coming out to beach cleanups, uh, voting for the right people in office, and really voting with your wallet. Believe it or not, every day you spend money on items, right? And just by supporting a business that doesn't use plastic compared to a business that does will in the end help promote sustainability within business itself. Um, so just some things to take into, into consideration. Um, so yeah, go back one. Yep, so um, just like by 2050 there will be more plastic than fish, this is correlated to it. Fish or uh, Birds eat fish correctly, so 99% of seabirds will actually have ingested plastic by 2050 as well. Um, and plastic can entangle seabirds, strangle them to death, and even block their digestive system like I had mentioned before. Um, and this picture was actually taken, all these pictures, other than the ones we pointed out, were taken in Miami at our local beach cleanups going on here. Um, so this was actually in Peacock Park in Coconut Grove. Uh, we found this bird kind of wrapped in fishing line. I don't know if you guys can see the fishing line, but he's kind of holding it right there. Um, so, you know, within the mangroves itself, a lot of things come into the mangroves and never leave. Uh, things that are included in there, plastic bags, fishing rope. Uh, Manny back here from Philabag, he regularly cleans the mangroves over here. Uh, by No Name Harbor, and you know he could tell you about the amounts of plastic that he pulls out of there itself. So mangroves are an important aspect to South Florida because they are a huge uh, supporter of life. They create nurseries for these youth and or uh, young animals to grow up in, and they also protect our coastlines. Believe it or not, without mangroves, any hurricanes that would come by Florida would destroy the coastline. Um, so mangroves help hold in place the soil, and they prevent beach erosion. So this is a video about nurdles. Before we show the video, how many of you guys have ever heard of nurdles? A couple people. It's a funny word. Can anyone guess what it is that doesn't know? One of you guys, one of the kids. What do you guys think a nurdle is? A bird. Anyone else? A turtle? No, a nurdle turtle? No. Anyone else want to guess? All right, well, they're pieces of plastic. So this video is kind of explained. <laughs> Microscopic pieces of raw plastic used to make the items people use every single day, such as water bottles, milk jugs, and plastic bags. A recent study showed that 53 billion nurdles enter our oceans each year from the UK alone. That's equivalent to 88 million plastic bottles. Because of their small size, microplastics can easily be ingested by animals such as small birds, fish, and iguana, allowing plastic toxins to enter the food chain. So what can you do to help? Educate yourself. Incorporate clean learn into your daily habits. Ditch single use plastics and get two friends to join you. By doing these three simple tasks, you will start doing your part in reducing plastic. So you guys saw how easily animals can ingest this, right? You saw the comparison between food crumbs and the actual plastic itself, right? So nurdles are essentially what is used to create anything that's plastic. So these plastic manufacturers are buying nurdles in its raw form and they're using them to create whatever they're selling as an end product, whether it be a water bottle, whether it be a plain part, uh, whether it be the seats that you guys are sitting on right now, um, anything, right? So these are already in microplastic form. They're super small and are easily lost. So 
The UK alone produces 53 or releases 53 billion of nurdles, nurdles into the environment every single year. You guys saw how small the UK was in comparison to the United States, right? So in the UK, people are finding nurdles all over the beaches there, like constantly. Um, and they're very hard to see because they blend in with the sand, the rocks, um, and everything like that. So the odds are, if you guys have ever been to Crandon or any, any beach in, in reality in Miami, um, you guys have probably sat or laid on one or two nurdles before without even knowing it because you guys can't see them. Um, so they look like little pellets. They almost look like food crumbs. Um, and they come in different colors. And they're all pretty much the same size. They're pretty much two millimeters in size, which is already a microplastic. Um, and, and like Kobe said before, how plastics can absorb toxins. So these, these little pellets can actually absorb chemicals like DDT. They can uh, absorb diseases like E. coli, and they're very harmful when animals ingest them. So out of all these products here, after our experiences um, with the recycling center and the incinerator here in Miami, uh, of these six items, which do you think are recyclable? Pizza? Coke can? Water bottle? Straws? No straws? What, what can be recycled? Sounds like a lot of confusion, and uh, that's, that's what the deal is here in Miami. There's, it's, the people don't really know what they can and can't recycle, but we're here to kind of clear things up. So out of these six items, there's only two that can be recycled. Which two do you think it is? Yeah, no, she got it, she got it. Cans and water bottles. So, because cans are aluminum, aluminum can actually be recycled very well and very efficiently, especially here in Miami. Even if you throw aluminum in the garbage and it goes to the incinerator, they actually try to sort out the aluminum from the trash before they burn it and then actually recycle that because there's more of a demand for aluminum than plastic products. That's why aluminum uh, gets recycled more than plastic because it's all about supply and demand. And the plastic water bottle, it can be recycled, but not like that. It still has a cap on it. So if you want your plastic water bottle to be recycled, well, hopefully you won't use plastic water bottle if it's a single-use plastic, and we want to stay away from those. Uh, you have to take the cap off of any plastic that you put into the recycle bin. And in, directly in the bin, you can't put it inside of a plastic bag either. At the recycling center, they won't open any plastic bag because it's a, it's a liability. They don't know what's in there. And, they don't want one of their workers to go and open something that could be detrimental to their health. And you have to separate the cap from the bottle because those are two different types of plastic. So they can't go and, and melt that bottle down because then the, the plastic will be mixed with two different types. Uh, straws cannot be recycled. The pizza box, um, there is cardboard recycling um, here in Miami, but it's, uh, it's not very common because a lot of the cardboard that we use ends up being contaminated. Like that one would for sure have a bunch of grease from that pizza on it, and they can't do anything with greasy cardboard. Uh, those red Solo cups, even if they do have the recycle sign on them, that doesn't mean that they are recycled. Um, so essentially with that recycle sign, uh, there's no... Um, uh, there's no way to, to measure, like, it, it's not legitimate, per se, because uh, it all comes down to your local recycling center. And here in Miami, they don't recycle. Just because they are recyclable in other facilities, maybe like one or two in the country, does not mean that it's going to get recycled here in Miami. So you, have to check the you have to check the number. But here, specifically for Miami, uh, they only recycle the numbers one and two and closed neck containers without the cap. So that's, yeah, exactly. And no clams, nothing. It has to be a closed neck container like that water bottle. So all the food that you guys buy at the grocery store sometimes that comes wrapped in plastic or from Whole Foods, the, the cakes or cookies you guys buy, even though they do have that recycling logo on there, it's, it's yeah. just, it's not gonna get recycled. Um, and there's, there's a really good documentary out right now on Netflix, it's called Unbroken? It's called Broken. Or Broken, yeah. okay, it's called Broken. And basically, there's an episode on recycling and you know, kind of explaining in depth about the business behind it and how it's gotten lost within the last couple of years. Um, and it, it explains, because in the end, we were shipping a lot of plastic to China. Like, uh, I think two years ago, China stopped taking all of our trash. So then we started shipping it to Malaysia, right? 
Malaysia is now saying no to all our trash. So all this trash is actually coming back to these developed countries now for us to deal with it in our own countries. Um, so very soon there's going to be an accumulation of all this garbage and states, uh, cities like New York, Miami, Los Angeles, where there's metropolises are all going to have to deal with garbage in different ways. Uh, I think New York actually pledged to discontinue all landfill use by 2025. So they're, they're on a crunch time basically to find a way to deal with all of their garbage. So it's, it's an important problem and it's, it's something that everyone's got to take into their own hands because in the end there are groups that are doing this stuff but it comes down to individual stuff as well. You know like you guys have the power to choose between products that use plastic and don't use plastic. So it's up to the individuals but it's also up to the the, uh, the producers as well. It, just, it, it needs to be a healthy balance between the two. Yeah, I know it sounds like a lot of information and, and maybe a lot of negative information, but there is one solution and it's very clear. It's to just produce less waste. And that's uh, commonly referred to as living a zero waste lifestyle. And that's arguably one of the best things you can do to help this whole problem that we're here presenting you with today. Um, if, if you don't produce any waste, then there's no, you're not contributing to all the plastic in the ocean or in the landfills or any of this plastic that's getting shipped off to other countries because ours can't deal with it. Um, and if you do have to use like a single use item, um, just try to use like aluminum or other materials that are, are not plastic, like aluminum and paper are great alternatives for plastic. Yeah, so as you can see here, this is a picture in the landfill. There's just so that much. That was a recycling facility. Uh, sorry, yeah, the recycling facility. Like yeah, exactly. It looks like a landfill because of how much stuff is actually in there. If you see this, there's just a lot of plastic bags and random things that aren't recycled. And that's because uh, people all over the country are not recycling correctly. They, don't, they aren't aware of the exact recycling guidelines of their local facility. And, they just throw anything with the recycle sign in there, but you, you can't blame them. It's, it's not your fault. It, uh, they're not making it very easy for us, so it's just important to be aware and uh, get involved and, and spread the awareness as well. So if Recycle bins have instructions on them. So yeah. The problem is people can't read. That too. <laughs> no, that, that too. That's also very true. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the stuff that flows through these recycling facilities is machine sorted and then it processes through a patch where people are hand sorting the stuff. Um, so if you guys look, there's little boards that are right here behind them for these workers to glance out every now and then. And these boards basically have a pick priority to it, right? So on these boards, it's tin, aluminum as number one because they can get the most money from it, right? Then it's followed by PET, so plastic water bottles or milk jugs. Uh, and then it goes to cardboard, and the last thing I think was like the almond milk jugs. So those are also cardboard, but it's a different type of cardboard. Um, so out of all those objects, there's nowhere on there that says to recycle or for them to pick up these clamshells that you guys were mentioning before, um, plastic bags, or anything like that that we use very commonly here in the U.S. Um, so all this stuff is being sorted and these people have to deal with it every single day. Um, so by not recycling correctly, you're making their job a lot harder too. <laughs> what those milk cartons? No, milk cartons. Yeah. yeah, the almond milk ones and also the milk jugs, those are recyclable. But without the cap. Right? Without the cap. So the, on the beaches, you yep. see so many caps. Yes. Does the bottles disintegrate and the caps are not disintegrated? No. So None of the plastic disintegrates. Well, it disintegrates, but it never goes away. So it only breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. So a lot of the times, because what we had mentioned before, how the, the bottle caps actually just end up going to the landfill. So when you, when you think about it, people are recycling water bottles maybe 30, 40% of the time, right? They're throwing it in that recycling bin. All those bottle caps are just going to the landfill. So that's why you see a lot more bottle caps than bottles on the beaches is because they're not being recycled whatsoever. Um, and also they're very easily discarded since they are smaller than water bottles. Um, they, they can be mixed into the seaweed very easily. Um, and that's where you see videos of fish like mahi mahi having these bottle caps inside of their stomachs because they resemble these little fish that they eat out of the sargasso patches offshore. Um, 
So yeah, that's why you see more bottle caps and stuff on the beaches than bottles itself. Yeah? Is there anything being done to clean up the garbage patches? So there are some efforts now. About two years ago, three years ago, um, it started. It was kind of, it, this is kind of like the new gold rush in a way. So all this plastic waste that is accumulating in the ocean still has value at some point. Um, these people, like the ocean cleanup, uh, Four Ocean is, is launching now a vessel to go out there and clean up the patch as well. Um, and it, it, there's a very like gray area when it comes to making product out of the actual physical plastic that they are gathering from the ocean because a lot of it is contaminated, it has algae growing on it, or it's been photodegrading and it doesn't have the same structure it, it's had once it left the uh, facility. But it is, it is kind of like a gold rush now and these companies are trying to find ways to create products uh, out of this plastic that is coming from the oceans. Um, but there are a lot of things that goes into it. They have to make sure it's safe for people to use. Um, they gotta make sure it's not something that's gonna put the plastic back in the ocean. So, you know, making clothing out of recycled plastic is, is great, but in the end, it does contribute to the microfiber pollution issue. Um, I was also on the ocean cleanup trip, so I'm gonna chime in here real quick. Nice. Whoever asked the question about being in the garbage patch, it is super cost ineffective yeah. to get out there. The project that I was a part of was a $32 million expedition that took seven weeks. And, you know, big organizations like Maersk are chiming in, big organizations that have a negative rep mm -hmm. are putting money into mitigation efforts, but it's expensive. And these garbage patches, the one in the Great Pacific garbage patch is a thousand miles from the nearest port. It's so far. Mm. And, you know, getting a vessel big enough is cost prohibitive. And then you gotta think of fuel as well, you know? Thousands of tons of diesel. Yeah. And, you know, so it's cost ineffective, and then also the problem of being able to fix and deal with the plastic that's been out there for years. It's a really big problem, but it is a gold mine because we are reaching a petroleum problem, and we are yeah. reaching a point where recycling and reusing our plastic is gonna be what's in. And a lot of these organizations are looking towards that future, yeah. but it's unbelievably expensive. And cleaning up isn't essentially the solution to this issue. You know, we can, we can clean the beaches here as much as we want, and it's not the solution. You know, we regularly clean Hobie Beach, Virginia Key Island a lot, right? And that beach, I think we clean it about once a month, and our average weight there is about 450 pounds. So every month we're pulling 450 pounds from the same location. Um, so it's really the cleanups for us are really just a way to get people to come out visualize and see the issue. You know, you could see it on a PowerPoint, you could see it on the internet all you want, but you won't physically realize how big of an issue it is until you're picking up 12 straws off the beach in a span of like 10 feet, or you're picking up a couple water bottles that you may have possibly contributed to. Um, so the cleanups are really just a way to educate people with hands-on learning. What I think is lacking is any campaign to ask the, tell the people, ask the people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, every day, just go out on the beach in the first place. place. <laughs> but what, what really bothers me is when I get near, uh, there are so many garbage containers along, mm -hmm. the, along the beach for yeah. people to throw their stuff in. And you'll see, from me to you, all this trash around the garbage cans. They yep. didn't even walk over to the garbage can. Until it's true. It's too ridiculous. Yep. But there's no advertising, there's no publication on television telling people, clean up after yourself. It's true. And it's just a lot. Yeah, I mean, even when, I think back in the 70s, there was actually, I, I learned this from this documentary that we had mentioned before, um, but the plastic production people actually launched a campaign putting the scope of the issue on the consumers, right? So it showed that, hey, you know, like, using plastic is great, but people are throwing that on the ground, essentially, right? So plastic production, uh, plastic producers were, essentially blaming the issue on the consumers, right? Which is also true, but it, I think it's, there's a lot of finger pointing that's going along, and people are blaming the users, and then the users are blaming the producers, and it just goes back and forth, and nothing's done in the end. I think it, it needs to come from both ends. I think plastic producers need to be producing less plastic or seeking alternatives, and consumers also need to be taking a hand and Again, spending money on the right items. You know, you can vote with your wallet, and by not buying that one water bottle and instead using a reasonable one, you're going to limit the supply and you're going to limit the demand for that specific product. Back in the back, yep. In the past handful of years, 
water bottles have gotten a lot less dense. Yes, so they have been reducing the amount of plastic. Or is that only saving the plastic? It's it's all it's it's probably saving the the plastic company is a lot of money. It's less money that they have to spend on a water bottle, so they're essentially making more money off you and not using that money to give back or clean up at all. Yep. I saw you had a question there. What about glass? Glass. So glass is a tough subject. Uh, a lot of the times companies here don't recycle it because it's very it weighs a lot. Right? So they're not processing all this stuff because it's costing them too much money. Um, glass is good because it does biodegrade into sand particles in the end. It just takes a lot of time for that to happen. So. If I can add to that yep. about glass, um, Florida has been talking about stopping their glass recycling program because they don't reproduce new glass bottles. Yep. They make sand out of the glass, and yep. that is um, becoming less and less profitable. And so eventually, if it's not profitable, they won't want to do it. Um, I'll just put this out there. Contact your <laughs> legislators and tell them that you think they should keep recycling glass because that's the easiest thing mm -hmm. to recycle. And I mean, also reuse it. I mean, it's you know, called private companies, of course. You, you can, can buy glass bottles and reuse them, refill it. There's a market called Verde, it's in Wynwood, and you can actually refill on almost everything that you would buy at Publix or Target. Uh, Kobe goes to, there quite often. Yeah, you just so. To bring your own container and pretty much anything you could need to live your life, uh, they'll have it there and you can just refill it without using any plastic. I also use glass containers that are like old tomato. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome too. The jars that you guys use for like jam. Mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. Better, you had a question over here? Oh, I think she just said it. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Nope. No. So if you guys like, a lot of times they'll give you styrofoam ones here in Miami. Uh, styrofoam is probably the worst of all plastics because it can't be recycled in any way. Uh, styrene, which is a chemical that's actually found in styrofoam, gets leached out into the food or the drink that you guys have if it's a hot food or drink. So the heat pretty much releases that chemical into the whatever you're eating out of that container. Um, and in the end, when it's on the beaches and it gets photodegraded, it, it's very easily put into these micro pellets, right? So have you guys ever picked up a piece of styrofoam off the road or seen it hit by a car? It just kind of disintegrates on impact. And that's because it's, it's composed of these tiny little beads that are just fused together. So it's very easily ripped apart, and then you have a huge mess of microplastics left over. Yep, in the back. Uh, for the past five years, the Rosensteel School has been doing a study on surface currents uh -huh. um, with GPS and little drip cards. Yep. And you said you've been cleaning up the same beach every week. Yep. Um, they have found that pretty much uh, over 70% of what comes up on the beach was, was discarded very close to the beach yep. or with something that's come from, uh, you know, drain yeah. Yep. Drain pipes. So pretty much if somebody throws a chip bag or something in the street and it's close to where your beach is, you are going to be picking it yep. up. I mean, um, I, so it's, it's not it's crazy. from somebody else's neighborhood. It's, it's a true. great majority. If it's coming on your beach, somebody you know probably threw it out there. <laughs> yeah. Not in the water, but. Do any of you ever walk down Fernwood? Yes. 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 You ever notice how much trash there is on the side of the road? Yes. yes. That's, how many blocks was that from our beach? Right yep. Manny's a local legend over here on Key Biscayne. <laughs> if you guys don't know him, he set up all the posts that have the buckets on the beach so that when you take your morning walks, you can grab a bucket, fill it up with some trash, dump it in the trash can, and turn a meaningful walk into a morning cleanup. So, uh, what streets are they on? There's there's one at uh, the beach club at the beach park. There's one at uh, the Oceana Path. Key Colony has one. The Commodore Club. Two up in Crandon. Uh, and there's one coming soon to the Great Tree Path. All right. So yeah, that's a great way for you guys to turn just a simple walk on the beach into a little micro cleanup. Um, so you guys can just do your part that way. Um, limiting your single-use plastics use, um, 
you know, just trying to advocate for it within your little community, whether it's at your school, in your sporting area, uh, if you play soccer, and, or any other sport in general, and you see how much plastic is being used, whether it's a water bottle, Gatorade, or the snacks you guys are getting is coming in plastic, talk to the parents that are organizing all the efforts to get the snacks and the water, and tell them that you want to get reusable bottles instead for the entire team, or you want to start getting the Gatorade in big powder, basically, so that way you can limit the use of Gatorade itself and just refill it. Um, so there's a ton of different ways you guys can help, you know? Uh, yeah, but ultimately, like, the best thing you can do is just reduce uh, your individual use and then pass that on to others. Yeah, yeah, this is just adding to the recycling side. It's a shame because all of us old folks, I don't know how many of you are in here, maybe you don't remember when, when you bought Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. when you bought beer, when you bought ginger ale, mm -hmm. it didn't come in a can. Mm -hmm. It didn't even come in a cup that you could get. What did it come in? It came in a glass bottle. And in your sink, I mean in your kitchen, mm -hmm. you had a container that when you drank one of these bottles, you put it in the container. When you had six of them, you took them back to the grocery store. Just the way you took them home yep. from the grocery yeah. store. And you so get money back. back so Europe, because, uh, Europe has been doing it. They're still doing it there. Yeah. 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 The thing is, uh, these big oil companies that make all the plastic can't make money that way. And that's what it's come down to. You guys have heard of all the straw bans that are happening. And there was a moment where the state of Florida was actually battling all these little micro communities and local governments to release ordinances to ban the bans on a plastic. So they were trying to ban the action of banning a plastic. It is, it's still in effect. It's been in effect for about a year now. Yep. So basically, one of, one of the big lobbyist groups that's funding the, the lawyers for that entire battle uh, comes from the Florida oh, Retail. Yeah, Florida Retail Federation, and then that's Publix, Walmart, Target, and CVS. They are all spending the money that you spend when you go to their stores. They spend that on lobbying to make it illegal to ban plastic. So they want to keep plastic uh, the, pumping the out. They're going to be losing money. If, they're run, if they can't use plastic anymore, they're going to have to spend more money on paper bags or alternatives, right? And the reason why these alternatives aren't as competitive when it comes to price with plastic is because there's no demand for them yet, right? So you guys all have the power to start purchasing these alternative plastics or these bioplastics to start creating a demand for it and having these production facilities start switching to these bioplastics instead of regular plastic. The glass bottles like they used to do. Yep. Um, it is cheaper for the companies to create and use and dispose of plastic than it is to wash and reuse glass. That's, why that's they because do it. of the pricing and not yeah. because well, of Yeah, well, plastic is super, super cheap yeah. and that's the problem. So yeah. they'd rather even, in, do that. even in the recycling facilities, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but they said that they're losing money every single year and that the landfill is actually cheaper than the recycling facility. So a lot of the waste that does end up going to these recycling facilities, they tell the truck drivers sometimes just to turn it around and take it straight to the landfill. So even if you did recycle that one plastic bottle you used, they might have not made it to that recycling facility at all. And we all have voices, you know, whether you guys are young or old, we all have the power to vote. We all have the power to post stuff on social media for the younger kids and really just try and advocate for a sustainable lifestyle and just share information. I mean, social media is, is so important now because it, everything's at the, like the click of a button. You can share something. And it requires no physical effort. It's literally just moving a finger two inches, you know? And it's just reading information correctly and um, sharing it and making sure that the stuff you're putting out is correct uh, because it's great if a lot of people are sharing things, but if it's not the right information, it can cause confusion. Right. Can you explain like what supply and demand is? Kind of like, like, what supply and okay, so basically supply and demand, you guys probably haven't learned this yet, but when you go to the store, right, if a lot of people are buying item one compared to item B, item one is going to, or item A compared to item B, sorry, item A is going to become way more cheaper than item B because there's more of a supply for it. So these producers that are creating item A are going to be able to create way more of them at the single time and sell all of them at like 
at way quicker than item B, right? So that's supply and demand pretty much. So the more someone wants something, the cheaper it gets. Um, and then, yeah, so here are some ways that you guys can help uh, attend local beach cleanups, whether it's just you walking down the beach with one of Manny's buckets. Uh, we host cleanups every single weekend in different parts of Miami, so if you want to you know, go away from the key and go check out Coconut Grove or, or Bayfront Park, Miami Beach, uh, we do a couple cleanups there. Uh, we have one this weekend at Matheson Hammock Park, so this is going to be a mangrove cleanup. Um, so we're going to be walking down this one path that actually got destroyed after Hurricane Irma, and they just haven't fixed it since. Uh, Matheson Hammock Park has been kind of a train wreck when it comes to fixing stuff. They haven't really done much. Um, the restaurant that's there was damaged by the hurricane, and they kind of just left it, and now it's kind of, I think it's being abandoned, actually. Um, the parking lot at Matheson Hammock Park floods a lot during king tides, and it's been flooding for, I don't know, the last 10 years now. Um, during the king tides, how many of you guys saw flooding anywhere at Crandon Marina or anywhere else here on the Key? Right? It was crazy. There were literally like jellyfish walk washing up into the parking lots. It was nuts. Um, but yeah, this, it, recently also this year, Brickell started flooding from the king tides, which hadn't happened in the previous years. Um, so it does show that there is an, a gradual increase in whatever tide is coming. Um, but yeah, different ways you can also help is by purchasing sustainable products, voting with your wallet, like we had mentioned before, and then sharing social media or sharing information on social media. You guys all have the power to share something. Um, instead of spending countless hours scrolling through pointless stuff, you know, share something now and then. You know, try and get the word out about this information and become a little eco warrior within social media. But don't get stuck on social media. You want to create action as well. It's great to post something. But don't feel accomplished until you've actually gone out and tried to solve the issue away from your phone. So those are some different ways you guys can help. And that's our presentation. <laughs> any more questions? Anybody have any more questions? Yeah. You were talking about the, the pool from Planet 7 traveling and going into Coconut Grove. Yes. Yes, so a lot of the times the currents take stuff everywhere. The Miami River itself is, is a very large source of plastics. Uh, we did a cleanup at Bayfront Park, what, like two months ago? About two months ago, we had 400 volunteers come out, and within four hours, we pulled 2,000 pounds of trash. So a literal full ton. It's, it's bad. Yep. Yep, and it's all the in industry that's along the river. It's all the industry, so there's all the industrial sites that are there. Yep. It's crazy. Stuff flows out of there on a regular basis, just like the storm drains. Yeah. And that's all microplastics, larger plastics. I mean, if you just sit at uh, the river's mouth in Brickell, and you sit, there's like a little park there, right? If you just sit there, you can literally count plastic, styrofoam, bags washing straight out of the river. It's, it's bad. I mean, people are starting to create, uh, like she had mentioned, the ocean cleanup, right? Uh -huh. So and while also going out into the garbage patch to try and recuperate those plastics, they're creating systems to filter out the water that's passing out of river mouths, like heavy rivers. So places in Indonesia, um, in India, uh, I think in Europe, they implemented a couple of these systems. And it's pretty much a giant arm that floats on the surface. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of this arm, there's a machine that just kind of sucks up all this plastic, puts it into these little bales, and then a boat comes and picks it up regularly. So they're trying to stop the source of this trash in a way. But that's, you know, again, that's not at the actual source. It's kind of the midway point between land-based trash and then ocean trash. So it's, it's a very large topic to cover, and you know companies are kind of scrambling to figure out solutions for it. So. I put my garbage in. I don't want to. Do so what what I do personally is I still have the plastic bag in the bin, but I'll just take the whole container out and just dump it over and reuse that plastic bag until it gets like to biodegradable bags as well now uh, that are based out of different materials. Yeah. It's just there's also a big issue with greenwashing. So greenwashing is basically where companies create this 
green product that's biodegradable, um, like utensils and plates and stuff like that, but they don't mention in larger text. They mention it on the box, but you have to really look for it. It says must be composted in an industrial facility. So there's no industrial composting facilities anywhere in Florida. Um, and if there are, they're maybe midway in the state, you know, so there's composting going on. I think, ha has it started yet on the key? Not yet. Not yet. So there's, there's a small nonprofit in Miami. It's called Back to Earth. Um, and you can res uh, compost your food waste with them. So pretty much they'll send you a bucket and they have different locations. I think they plan to have one on Key Biscayne in the near future. Um, but they have one in Coconut Grove, uh, drop-off station in Wynwood. So basically you take your food scraps and you can dump it in one of their bins and then they turn it into soil pretty much for growing gardens and I think they supply a couple of local gardens around Miami. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you.